Um, I had, uh, you know, I, I didn't finish properly covering all kinds of milk. Milk in every different form does something differently. Like I said about the, um, the yogurt and the kefir, uh, when you make those in a natural way, they're pre-digested, you'll get well quicker because everything is more digestible in the dairy. If you make butter, butter is excellent to lubricate everything in the body except the brain and nervous system. And most of the body is very deficient in fats. The butter gets to everything the quickest, except for the nervous system. I did mention that cream was the best thing for the brain and nervous system to calm it, relax it, to soothe it. The best thing to restore myelin is fish fat. Not fish oil, fish fat. It's again a mis... People want to sell fish oil, so they're going to stress the uh, the difference between the three and sixes, you know, and uh, all of the little key chemistry that they're going to throw at you because you don't know chemistry, and even if you do know chemistry, it sounds good. But in my uh, experimentation with foods, fish oils never did what fish did. Just like in coconut cream, you have the water-soluble fats, you have the proteins, you have everything in that substance. And some of it, a small percentage is oil with the oil-soluble vitamins. In fish oils, you have all of that removed. And when the FDA gets finished with the regulations, fish oil is never pure. They always have to treat it with a kerosene-based solvent or heat and both, well, it's both, that separates all the protein out of it so bacteria won't grow in the oil. And I dealt with another company that used to make it like they did back before pre-81. And fish oil, when you got it back then, stunk, it was cloudy, it had everything that the fish had in it. It was like juicing fish. <laughs> and it was good substance. Then they outlawed it and had said no bacteria could grow in it. It had to be a purified product. And then it all became garbage. Anybody that tells you you get a pure substance, they don't. So I got a company, finally talked them into making it, and they produced it. And guess what happened six months later? Is there any other way we can process this? Because it only lasts six months and we want a, a product all year round because this cod we can only get, this fish we can only get a one time, one season a year, and it will only last six months. I said, well, that's okay, sell it high, sell it rotten. That's okay, well, nobody's gonna buy it, nobody's gonna eat it. Yeah, they will, if they have any smarts about them. You educate them. Oh, no, no, we gotta have a clean product. So you know what's gonna happen? It's no longer gonna be a fish oil that's any good, or a fish fluid that's any good. So again, it's all about money. It's all about what they can get, how much they can get, not about the product itself. So okay, let's take a look at uh, the milk. When you have everything combined in it, it has, it has certain properties that will nourish the whole body. When you have butter, it gets to every, body, every place in the body and lubricates it except the nervous system. When you have the cream, it, it uh, soothes and, uh, and uh, coats it protects the nervous system. When you have the combination together, it will do a little of both. Now, for most people, most people are so starved, their bodies are like an orphanage. Any of the kids that are closest to the food and bigger, they're going to get the food, and the little guys in the back are going to get much. So when you take all that food through the digestive tract, anything in this area is going to get the food and hold on to it first. And if they can eat several massive amounts of food and not let go of it, it's not going to get out to the rest of the body as easily. And that's the way it is with fat especially. So you can eat all the butter you want, and all of a sudden you say, my skin's getting awfully dry. I'm eating all this fat, and I'm gaining this weight, and my skin's so dry. That's because the fats are being consumed completely because they're so hungry inside that they're not getting out to the outer exterior getting to the exterior. So the way I have 
developed a formula, or a friend of mine developed a formula called the lubrication or moisturizing formula. It has two names in all of my books. There's two names because I want it to be appealing to the women, which is a moisturizing formula, <laughs> and appealing to the men, which is a lubrication. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most important formula in my whole system. And when you and that's the combination of egg, butter, lemon juice, and a little bit of honey. And what that does is it helps break down the fat even before the bile gets to it. So it digests rapidly, so rapidly that all the organs and glands can't consume it all. So it gets out to every other part of the body, including the bones and the skin and the, the joints and the connective tissue that wouldn't normally get fed. So if you have that kind of a problem and you're not having the moisturizing lubrication formula, have it. And it's always best consumed after a meat meal or uh, a heavy egg and, and uh, dairy meal. Or in combination with. Okay, we're going to talk about, uh, oh, we started on the pattern of eating. So we have the, uh, the vegetable juice first thing in the morning. Okay, in order for the brain and nervous system to work properly, remember we talked about the AGEs, the advanced glycation end products? Well, if you eat a fruit, piece of fruit or a high carbohydrate uh, juice, like a carrot juice, you are going to cause the brain and nervous system fluids to be sticky, your blood to be sticky. So, not a good thing to do. So you want to eat some kind of a protein meal. I always have meat. My brain works so well when I have meat. If I just have dairy and eggs, I'll be good. But if I want to be a genius, I have meat at that first meal. And I have the butter with it, or the lubrication formula for me. Or I can have the moisturizing on the other side of it. So um, the moisturizing or lubrication formula with that meal and then the, if I want to make sure I've got lots of minerals for the day, I have the cheese and honey afterward, about 30 minutes after that. Now my brain is set for the day. However, you still have another five hours to go. If you eat a high carbohydrate in the first seven hours that you're awake, you will make glycogen with the carbohydrate. If you don't eat a high carbohydrate, the body's going to make the glycogen from pyruvate, a protein sugar. Now, the carbohydrate we discussed, very high acrylamides. If you have pyruvate as your protein uh, or sugar to make glycogen with the help of glucagon, you only have 7 to 8% advanced glycation end product, and we can have to handle 12% at a time. So that means you will not store not one molecule of advanced glycation end product. So the first seven hours you're awake after a long sleep, do not eat high carbohydrate food. Juice or any form. Pardon me? Juice or any form? Pardon? You said juice or any form? Any form of high carbohydrate food. No fruit, no juice, you know, like carrot juice or beet juice or anything like that. Unless it's just a small percentage of your juice, like 5-10% of your juice. You're not going to have much. Celery has a minus carbohydrate. You don't have enough carbohydrate to digest celery. So when you start with celery, you put a little bit of carrot with it and parsley, the high carbohydrate in that is going to be neutralized by the celery. So you can see how much thought and everything I put into all this. And it'll work. And it works 95, 98% of the time. Exactly like this. So, then the next, then you've got two to three hours you drink milk in between, preferably kefir yogurt, in the form of kefir yogurt. You can add eggs in between all you want, feel, you know, you're getting a little sleepy or drowsy. Take an egg, you know. Does everybody know how to eat an egg? Raw? Sure. You saw Rocky? <laughs> you break five eggs into a glass and you down it and you wipe your mouth like this. You don't wipe your mouth like that, it won't work. <laughs> <coughs> And that's how he did it, just down the five eggs. I do it, my throat's a little tight, I don't like that glob, you know, 
have an egg in my throat. It makes me want to kind of puke. So what I do is I do it the ogenous way. I take an egg. Hopefully it's got some fecal matter on it. And I'll explain that later. And I put a dent at one end. Not a hole, a dent. And then this end I make a hole with the cutting teeth in front. <coughs> Do you know any herbivore, any vegetarian animal that has cutting teeth? Does 90% of its mouth? No. Your vegetarian animals, your herbivores, all have all molars. So, you're going to go like this. And first the white comes out in little amounts. And the white doesn't taste like anything. So it's pretty benign. cool texture, as long as it's not a glob in my throat. And then the last to come out is the yolk. Now what you have is a hermetically sealed, perfect food, protein, carbohydrate, and everything. And now the waste product is completely biodegradable, the packaging. <laughs> Make sure I got all of it. And that's it. That's all there is to it. And then I don't have to clean a glass. Rocky has to clean a glass every time. I do not. So, you have eggs like that, your mind feels a little slow, you might be feeling a little sleepy. Grab an egg like that, or Rocky style and down it, and your mind will turn around in about 10 minutes. 10 to 12 minutes. And you'll be alert and focused again. If you eat a lot of foods at that time, you drink a lot of milk, you're going to get sleepy because you said it's like a baby drinking until it's full and says, oh, I can go to sleep again, you know? So when you want to stay alert and focused and working and concentrating, you eat something that's a full meal in one. It has all your protein and fats, but not a lot of it. Frequently, but not a lot at one time. And you'll stay open and focused. Let me give you an example. The uh, Los Angeles Police Department was hassling a lot of these runaways on Venice Beach. And I, got, I went on Venice Beach almost daily to get people on this diet from 1988 uh, all the way through 1995, trying to get as many people to do the diet as I could get to see its results, because I'd only worked with patients, you know, let's say 300 altogether or 500 altogether in all of those years. I wanted to work with thousands of people to see the results of this diet. So I set up a table out there and talked people into going into the diet. We're talking about in a five and a half year period, about 10,000 people, and about uh, talked about 10,000 people. But I got about 3,200 to do the diet and come back with results, and they were exceptional. So I was out there. I saw the police department hassling runaways. Now these are runaways who've been sexually abused or abused in some manner, and they weren't, you know, runaways. They were teenagers that were out there doing hair wraps, painting pictures, doing portraits and the police were ticketing them and running them off. So where did they have to go? Into drug trade or prostitution. So I was on the police's pocket like, I don't know, police's butt like hip pocket. And uh, Jerry Rubin, a uh, famous activist, and I got some attorneys together. We got print cards printed. And any time we saw a policeman hassling one of these people, we go up and say, this officer is depriving you of your civil rights. You have a total responsibility to be here. And if he cites you, you get in touch with this attorney, he will file suit on this man or this woman for citing you and for making your life miserable. So the police hated us. And I was the biggest offender because I would watch for them. So after five and a half years, they got this guy to attack me. He kept moving away, he kept coming at me and hitting me. And we're talking in deadly places. So I picked up a stick and I beat him. But I beat him, only him coming at me. Seven witnesses and they arrested me for um, uh, assault and battery. Because he was, that's what they were setting us up to do. And they got all of us, they got jingles, everybody knows the singing, uh, roller skating, seek. He was part of us too. So he got arrested, Jingles got arrested, uh, Jerry Rubin got arrested, and I got arrested all in that week because they were going to put a stop to us. <clears throat> so they weren't prepared for me, so I sued them. And I played my own attorney because I know what attorneys do. So I <clears throat> put them through five years of hell in the legal system. 
And when I got him finally into court in federal court, I'm the only lay person that's ever gotten this Los Angeles Police Department and the city into federal court. And I tried it myself. And I wrote legal documents two stacks this high. And I was carting them in every day into the, uh, into the hearing. And I was my own attorney. So I was on my feet all day long. I had 22 officers in there. And we're talking about, um, you know, uh, lieutenants and captains and, uh, and um, uh, sergeants that were there. They let four of them off the hook right away. So I had three of them on trial and uh, 22 for witnesses. And I proved without a doubt that they had arrested me and that they had set me up and conspired. Mm -hmm. So what happened, and during that time, that whole 22 days, you know how I survived? Because I had to prepare for questioning. Every officer, every question had to be understood and written. Because you don't go in there and think, uh, da, 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 da. You have to go in there with your plan of attack for each person that you were calling up as a witness. And you had to know what to ask them and what not to ask them. So I had to go through this every night and stand on my feet all day long to this. I was getting one and a half hours sleep a day. And I got it 10 minutes at a time, even in the courtroom. <laughs> and one time I said, I need a short recess, 10 minutes, I went to sleep right there. And the guy came up, woke up, and went right back to work. And I, they don't allow any kind of food in the uh, courtroom. And I said, you have to let me have a, I have a, a, um, a motion here, a, a citing that says that I was diagnosed with diabetes. Of course, I wasn't diabetic anymore. But, uh, you know, I would have symptoms of diabetes like anybody would be low blood sugar. I didn't have my food. So I said that I have to have my food in the courtroom and eat during court. So I got it. So I'm there downing raw eggs like you just saw <laughs> in the courtroom, <laughs> drinking my milk. I'm doing that. So um, that's what I got. I got an hour and a half sleep a day. And then when it was all over and, uh, you know, went to the jury, they switched a juror. A juror that had been working with the police department for 10 years. You don't see any record of her ever being in the jury. And all of a sudden this new juror is in there. And she convinced three of the jurors came out were waiting for me after the trial and said, this woman wouldn't let us wouldn't let us do it. She said, you know, this wasn't, I said, you've got a smoking gun there. You know, they said, but yeah. And I said, the stuff that she was telling you that I didn't have, they didn't give me, but yet the officer said that he had read it before he came. So they held that from the court. So that it was all set up. They knew they were, I was never going to win. But I cost them millions of dollars and lots of time and sweat. And they left all of those years alone during a whole seven years. And then they started hassling them again. You know, but then I was on to milk and other stuff. So anyway, that's the situation. But you can stay focused and conscious with those eggs, and a half a cup of milk at a time, egg maybe one hour, half a cup of milk another hour. If you want to stay focused, if you have to have physical energy, you're going to need more than that. You're going to have to have milkshakes, like a half a cup of milkshake at a time, uh, if you're doing physical labor. But if it's mental, mainly the eggs. Uh, will keep you physically and mentally focused. So let's say after this pro first protein meal, you have the vegetable juice, then 45 minutes, an hour later, you have the, uh, the, the protein meal. Eggs and milk or meat and also butter. And then two, three hours later, you have a, I know that I'm swinging it around in there, you guys. <laughs> um, you have a milkshake. This helps calm the body and deliver it some energy. If you have the problem like I had where if you mix eggs and milk and, uh, and honey together you get cramps, you're not going to be able to do that. You should probably suck your eggs first, my style or Rocky style, and then uh, have some milk and cream afterwards and honey after that, maybe five, ten minutes after you down the eggs. Remember the eggs are going to go through very rapidly. So then uh, two to three hours after that, you have another vegetable juice. All of a sudden, now we've hit the time where you could eat some carbohydrate. But let's give it an hour or two anyway, just to make sure. So an hour or two after the, uh, the uh, uh, second juice, then have your one and only fruit meal of the day, and always with the fat. Now, remember that fruit is always detoxifying. The body makes alcohols with it. 
So it will utilize fat as energy and it will detoxify the system. So this is the time to do it. You don't want to do it early in the day because you don't want your day to be focused on detoxifying nor making everything sticky and poorly functional. And you don't want to late in the day because you're not going to sleep well if you're detoxifying at night. So this is the high time to have a fruit. If you want to lower the amount of detoxification, you don't have ripe fruit, you have non-sweet fruit that's on the green side. But always have it with fat anyway. And the best fat for cleaning is coconut cream. Coconut cream is an incredible solvent. Before, you know, 60 years ago, all of our soaps, body soaps, were 70 to 90 percent coconut. Everything, laundry soap, everything was made with coconut. Then when they discovered to make out all these acetates, um, soaps, you know, out of chemical um, petroleum products and kerosene, uh, they found that it was cheaper than to grow these coconuts to process and harvest and process them and then decontaminate them and deal with all the waste products. They could just make a chemical soap. And that's when, it, that's when all of the natural products went out the door for soaps. And they are great soap too. Coconut cream is what I use as my body soap. Uh, that's the soap, that's the coconut cream that I don't eat in time and it can becomes fermented. So I use it to brush my teeth with. And I use it to wash my body with. And hair and everything. And uh, it's a wonderful soap. But the coconut cream internally will do the same thing. It's the best cleanser. So have, you know, three to six tablespoons. If you're a big person, you have eight tablespoons, you know, of coconut cream at a time. But always have a natural fat with it. I mean an animal fat with it. Either cream or butter or a little bit of cream and butter with the coconut, both of them with the coconut. Because the coconut is more detoxifying the butter and the cream are protective. So if you've got the coconut cream pulling out a lot of heavy metals and other toxicity, you want that the animal fats there to protect your system from damage. So always have a little bit of the, the animal fats with, with the coconut cream when you have the fruit. And there are lots of ideas in the rest of the book. These eating systems that I'm telling you right now are on page 40 and 41 of the recipe book. But I'm going through it to explain why it is that way, which I don't do in the book as well as some people. Some people say that they didn't understand it because it's very concise and it doesn't go into much explanation. So I'm giving you the explanation now of why I set that schedule up and why it works. Okay, so we go from the fruit meal, and you can have different fruits. If you've got a problem, you know, you read in the We Want to Live in the Remedy section, you go through all of that and you say, I have that as a symptom, I've had that symptom, I've had that symptom, and these reoccur once in a while. And any symptom you've ever had is going to recur on you, I guarantee you, because you have never eaten properly to heal properly. So that area is always going to be revisited, the detoxification and the healing. So anything that you've ever gone through, you go and highlight that to the remedy section of my book so you know what fruits and what other foods to eat, so you can go to it right away. If you want an excellent way to do it, you go to wewanttolive.com. The T-O is a two numeral to wewanttolive.com, and you can get the PDF version from uh, the Adobe version. You can download it and search it. So you can have it like that. You don't even have to highlight it. You know, you know right where to go. Just put that word in, and you'll find it instantly. And it just costs us as much as the, the book does, you know, hard copy. but. It's a lot more, if you're a computer person uh, and don't have a lot of time, then that's an excellent thing to get and it's well worth the $30. And you don't have to pay shipping on it. <laughs> and no taxes, I don't think. Um, if you're in California, you might. Um, it's not my website. I just license somebody to be able to uh, distribute all of my information. It was an agreement because I don't have time to do it. And everybody is screaming at me. Where can we get more of your information? Where can we get more of your information? So you can. Now you can. <laughs> Lots of stuff that is not published is on that site. A lot of stuff. Articles that I've written that were published in obscure places and uh, other magazines, LA Times, all kinds of places. Uh, everything's on there that uh, I allow to be out yet. So, and my publisher allows. So that's a lot. 
So um, you go there and you find out you you know you know what foods you need to eat. So let's say you're having difficulties with your spine, and you know that papaya is helpful for that. So you have papaya for a couple of days a week. Don't have it repeatedly because it will create even more spinal detoxification. You could have it every other day for the weeks that you're dealing with your back. Uh, and if you're dealing with digestive problems, uh, you know, constipation, uh, something like that, then you could have pineapple with the coconut cream, butter, and dairy cream, and a little honey if you want. And you take those fats, you can whip them into a whipped cream and have it with a whole or chunks of fruit, or you can blend it all together. You know, it's like if you're trying to get rid of heavy metals, you could use dark berries, blueberries, blackberries, or boysenberries with that, those creams, those fats, and if you blend it together, it'll be like a parfait, you know, like a hard gelatin. It's pretty good. So you can do it many different ways to make it more appetizing, even though you may be eating the same thing. So that's how you work with that one. Then the next, you wait two to three hours to have another vegetable juice. Then an hour and a half, two hours later, your second and last meat meal or another large protein meal with a lot of eggs at one time and some dairy in that time if you're, uh, if you're not a meat eater. <clears throat> then uh, again, you know, have your lubrication formula or some butter with that meal or butter and honey if you're having eggs and milk. And again, usually when you have a milkshake at that late in the day, you're not going to digest as well and as quickly. So it might be better to down the eggs if you have digestive problems and then drink the milk and cream afterwards with a little butter and honey and then the cheese and the honey after that, about 30 minutes after that. And then before you go to bed, you know, you can have milk any time during the day, preferably room temperature or cold kefir yogurt if you want, or room temperature kefir yogurt, or even warm milk. You can warm it every time if you like. You can treat yourself like a baby. You're going to, if you're a person who's hyperactive and irritable all the time, warm milk will relax you all the time. It's a good thing. So before you go to bed, you make sure you want to relax, then have you know some uh, milk before you go to sleep. Warm milk and some honey, a little extra cream with it. And during the night, if you've had a big moisturizing or lubrication formula, and uh, you've had a third with each of your protein uh, meals, then during the night you'd have the remaining third with half a cup of milk just to make sure you always stay as lubricated as possible so your skin is always in the best shape that it can be. And the best facial soap is, uh, you know, fermented, the best shaving cream is fermented coconut cream. It gets kind of slimy and it's just so nice. I never cut myself with that. I used to shave with eggs. I put egg on my face and shave with eggs. Then when I discovered the fermented coconut cream, Never, it's so easy to shave, never any cut. Never any cut. I mean, for me to say that, that's amazing because I was always cutting myself no matter how around in here with these little scars that I have from my brother beating me up. <laughs> boom, <coughs> boom, and the little bumps came about there with the blisters and the cuts, something like that. And I was always cutting and I was always bleeding. But for some reason, the coconut cream, the fermented coconut, slimy coconut cream, works excellently. <coughs> was a shaving cream. So there you have it. Now, we're going to go for the long-awaited stuff, bacteria, parasites, and all of that stuff. Now, everybody's afraid of bacteria and parasites and virus and fungus and stuff like that. But those are your janitors. I mentioned it earlier just to give you an idea that they're not your enemy. They are your friends. In my experiments with animals, Animals who had parasites got well quicker than those who did not have parasites. Um, I also investigated the myth that raw meat created parasites, would give people parasites. Took many, we took 14 animals, all from the age of 12 to the age of 16, and these were so-called at-risk types of creatures because they were an old age, and all of them weak and feeble and fed them various different types of, of, of uh, parasite-infested um, meats. Uh, calves' brain that was infested with flukes, chicken tripes that was infested with pinworms, and uh, liver worms in, in a calf, a uh, calf's liver. We fed that to all these animals. Not one of them got a parasite. 
Now one of them got a parasite, and they all did very well and got healthier. The animals that we put in a ad for and got that already were infested with parasites. We took them and fed them raw foods, and they all got better. And their parasites continued and then went away within about six months. The latest was nine months on one of them. And we followed them to their death, and we performed autopsies on them. Their innards were brilliant, like they were young. So all wherever they had, whether they had the liver parasites or they had the brain flukes or wherever, when they were fed the raw meats, the raw dairy, and a little honey, they had immaculate healing. The animals that we gave, uh, you know, um, we took some of them and we fed them um, pharmaceutical grade and, uh, um, anti-wormer dewormers and uh, homeopathic dewormers. And those animals, when we got rid of the parasites, fed them the same raw diet, they didn't fare as well. The ones that were given the, par the pharmaceutical dewormers, still their organs, they got better and healthier on the raw diet. But when we performed autopsies on them, uh, their glands where they had had the parasites and we had poisoned them with the pharmaceutical dewormers were dark and brown, so they never healed properly. So those that we allowed the, the parasites to do their work and eat the raw diet got much healthier and stronger. So parasites are your friend. Bacteria are your friend. They eat degenerative tissue. Now let's say you're poisoned. You've taken antibiotics for everything all these years. You've taken penicillin. You've gotten injections. And you don't have any bacteria left in your life. You're going to have a lot of problems. And the only way your body's going to be able to clean is with virus. Virus are not alive. Taking antibiotics for a virus is the stupidest thing in the world. It was known 30 years ago. Virus are not alive. They're protein bodies that are, act like solvents. They dissolve tissue. They're not alive. Do not give antibiotics for viruses. And what do they do today? You have a virus, they'll give you an antibiotic. It's an absurd case. And they're always talking about, you have all these writers talking about live virus. It's a misnomer. There's no live virus. They had no respiratory system. They had no nucleus. It's like calling pied soap alive. It's ridiculous. And that's what viruses are. They are soaps. They are solvents that go in and dissolve tissue. And your body has over 320,000 varieties of virus. Each element of your tissue, intracellular tissue, has a different type of virus that's specific to dissolve that tissue when it's in trouble, when it needs to be dissolved and rid of. Just think, if one virus dissolved everything, then you would have complete dissolution and death. But the body is finite and intelligent even though you poisoned it to death. <coughs> with antibiotics and pollution. It makes finite viruses that specify a particular dissolution of tissue. And the pharmaceutical industry will say, and the doctors who are there on <clears throat> sales pitches, say, well look, it dissolves in this tissue, in this cell. It breaks apart this part of the cell. Yeah, so. But to get you thinking it's the end and all, that your cell is going to completely die because of it. It doesn't happen unless that cell is completely contaminated and destroyed. And the death of one cell in your body isn't going to kill you. So the medical profession and the pharmaceutical communities frighten you to death with all these stories. How can you get virus to be a contagion when it's not alive? The, you can put a virus in a petri dish that's fertile, that cells can grow in it, and not one more virus will appear in that petri dish under cellular conditions, even for a week. Not one more will appear. You put live cells in there and all of a sudden they start multiplying. But they don't multiply. Cells make virus. Just like we produce soap. You calling virus contagious is like saying Thai soap is contagious because it's in every home. Humans have made it as a soap to clean their laundry. Cells make virus to clean parts of themselves because they're too toxic to use bacteria, 
fungus or parasites to clean them out because we're too, poor, poll too polluted with poison. They can't live, they can't survive eating toxic ways. It's like I contaminate, let's say I eject an apple or I spread a field with, uh, let's say, arsenic. Apples grow from this field of arsenic. You've got a high content of, of, of um, arsenic in this apple, and I give it to you to eat. What's going to happen to you? You're going to die. Well, that's what happens with a bacteria and a parasite and a fungus when it goes to eat a cell that's contaminated. They die. So they don't multiply. So then all we have left is virus. The body has to produce virus to clean itself. But viruses are like soaps. What do you have to do with soaps? You dilute them in, in the H2O. And what happens there? When a parasite or a bacteria or a fungus eats something, it takes the amount of food that it, that it consumes and it dwindles it down to this tiny little waste product. Parasites can eat 100 times their weight in 24 hours and discard 1% of it. 1 to 2, 3, even 5 percent when you pong parasite. That means it's like you eating 100 pounds of food in a day and having a one pound bird in the morning. Pretty efficient. I like that. I like that. Because that parasite is major that I have to discard a very small amount. Now bacteria, depending upon the bacteria, can eat about half of that in 24 hours. But still, its waste product is a small amount. What happens? We eat 7, 14 pounds of food in a day. A lot of people eat that much. And they have a one pound turn the next day. That's not a good ratio. I'll take the parasite and the bacteria any day as my assistance. Fungus is the same way. It takes something and reduces it in stature. When your body uses fungus, I mean virus, it dilutes and spreads it all throughout the system. That's why viral meningitis is a problem with coma. Because when you have a viral meningitis, which means the coating around the brain or the nervous system is infected. It's got pollution in it, there's nerve damage in there, and the body needs to dissolve it and clean it out. Anytime you have an infection, means the cleaning, janitory going on, you have more nutrients flowing to the area, and that's what swelling is. You always want swelling, you never want to stop swelling. People put ice packs on things, and what do they do? They prevent the circulation. So all of those many nutrients are being moved into that area to clean out and feed the area and heal it. They put ice packs on it, what happens? It clots. They don't heal properly. So you've got an athlete. He has a knee injury. They want to keep him in the, in the ball game. So they put ice packs on it. Lower the swelling. Wrap it with a, you know, ace bandage. Give him an injection of cortisone and send him out in the field. What happens in five years? His knee's gone. His knee's blown. Four, five, six operations and surgeries and finally when he's an old man the only thing he can do and an old man for an athlete is 45 47 years old he's got a knee transplant which means he's got a piece of plastic put in as a knee that's not the way you handle it never freeze a swollen area you put a hot water bottle next to it you put heat there to increase circulation you'll get well faster Always put heat. Never a heating pad because you have an EMF field. Hot water bottle. EMF fields destroy the electric, the uh, molecular structure of cells. So always, I don't care if you put hot water in a glass and wrap it with a towel. That can be your hot water bottle. The best is a rubber one if you want it to last a long time. A true rubber hot water bottle. So it doesn't outgas um, plastic. So when you have all this viral contamination, your body has to get rid of all that fluid. And if you've got that swelling in the meningite, the extreme swelling from the viral, you've got possibility of damaging and rupturing you know, uh, the consciousness center, so you go into a coma, or you have an aneurysm, or you have a broken blood vessel in the brain. You ever have that kind of situation where you have a headache? And it's getting strong. You can lay down on your back, put two hot water bottles on either side of your head. You put a towel over the hot water bottles on your head so you're tenting the heat into your head. And what will happen is all of the, um, the sinew, the uh, tendons that connect these fissures in your brain will relax and allow the skull to expand. Headaches, or when the brain expands and the skull doesn't. 
and it puts pressure in the meningi. So you want to relax so the brain, the skull can expand with the brain, then there's 80 percent of your headache gone. Then with the, the headache formulas in the book, you can get rid of the rest of it. <clears throat> That's, you know, lemon and, uh, and honey and sparkling waters and some cream. There are different headache formulas in the, in the remedy section of We Want to Live. So that's how you handle it. So, what would you rather have? A viral infection or a parasite? Or a bacteria? Or a, a fungus? I'll take any of them over a virus. And I want all of them because I want to be clean. I don't want to stop any of them. I wouldn't be well today if I stopped them. I would be dead today if I stopped them. I've had spinal meningitis four times in my life because of the damage they did to my spine, creating bone cancer and, and solidifying my spine with that radiation. I was in miserable pain. I rarely have pain in my back anymore. My back is almost completely renewed. Just one little vertebrae right here still isn't intact yet, but all the others are. And I've got 14 years to go to reach my four years. Now I'm already satisfied. But it works. Don't stop those detoxification. If you need to stop them because you've got to function and you've got to feed your babies or take care of them and work, the way to do it is lime juice, not lemon juice. Lemon is a bacterial inciter. It helps dissolve uh, anything. It helps. That's why people marinate in lemon juice because it helps break down, it helps fermentation, it helps bacterial growth. Lime juice inhibits it. So if you put, let's say, three to five tablespoons, or even six if you're a bigger person, six tablespoons of lime juice with about two ounces of honey, which is about four ounces, I mean four tablespoons of honey, four to six tablespoons of honey, um, about uh, four tablespoons of coconut cream, and about one tablespoon of dairy cream. You blend that all together and mix it with about three to four ounces of Gerol Steiner or Perrier or one of those naturally sparkling waters. And you drink that, a little of that, like two ounces of it or three ounces of it, uh, every three to four hours. It'll be your natural antibiotic and it will slow it down. Now, if you have too much lime, it'll do just like an antibiotic. It will destroy all of your bacteria, intestinal everywhere but at least it won't have the side effects of an antibiotic and the long-term damage. It'll just ruin your digestion for uh, three to six weeks. And then you have to live on sucking eggs. <laughs> so if you want to suck eggs for a few weeks only, and have some milk at night, then have all the lime juice you want and stop your detoxification. Okay. So let the body do go through its natural processes. It is very intelligent. I wouldn't be walking today. Just remember, I was a worm in constant pain. Severe, chronic, intense, excruciating pain. 24 hours a day. Even when I was unconscious in sleep, I felt pain. Until I learned the bathtub, then I had some respite. When I learned to sleep in a bathtub, it was like discovering the world was round. Only more efficient more helpful. So um, don't, don't try to stop your detoxification. Try to endure them until they finish. And there are many remedies in the book to help you get through any kind of detoxification. Okay, we're at the question and answer period. Any questions? And who's going to give the answer? <laughs> yes? You mentioned the, uh, the problems with your teeth and getting cavities. Now, I happen to be one of those people who ended up with having dental work, at which point I ended up with nothing but cavity. And of course, it has amalgam, which is mercury. Mm -hmm. Now, from all I've been able to research, there are very few dentists that can take your ca uh, mercury out of the system now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have a big chance of really getting a flood of poisoning. Correct. Now, uh, do you have anything in your books about slowly detoxifying that mercury out of your system? 
Yes, I do. And the we're talking about juices, eating uh, cilantro juice as part of your vegetable juice that helps to get out slowly. Also, I talk about the blueberries, blackberries, and boysenberries with the coconut cream. They're both uh, they're both in the recipe book because those remedies came later. Is the recipe book also downloadable online? Yes, it is. Because I like to go to search. <laughs> it's easier that way. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Oh, let me say something about that. A lot of people want to rush to get the mercury out of their teeth. Don't do it. I say on the, the, if you're in ill health, wait two and a half years to you've been on this kind of diet. Or all high, you know, animal food, protein, milk, egg, meat, even meat diet, until you've strengthened yourself before you have that mercury removed. Because even if you have a good dentist that knows how to put the dam in there and prevent you from uh, from going into your mouth and down your throat, you're going to, and you've got to learn how to breathe also because it's going to go right into your nose, some of that dust. And that's a very dangerous dust. It's mercury. Part of the main part of it is mercury. So you've got to learn to breathe when he's drilling, not drilling. You know, when he's not drilling, you, you breathe and you don't see any vapor or dust in the air. So you've got to learn to hold your breath. You've got to really work it. Or you make an agreement with the dentist. You drill 10 seconds, you know, you let me breathe. Or you get a mask and put it on your nose or oxygen on your nose so you're not breathing that mercury. I don't like synthesized oxygen, but it's better than having mercury in your system. So... You know, you might put the oxygen tubes up your nose and a little bit of tape over it so that you're not breathing any of the dust that comes into your face. But even if you protect yourself there, the mercury that's already in your nerve going all the way to your brain will start detoxifying when you have them removed. So you better be well equipped for it and you better be healthy. Because I've seen some people go into chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia because they've had it done too soon. And if you have a question about that, I got a fellow who called me last night. And I warned him and warned him and warned him for three months, don't do it. He, he had chemical sensitivity. He says, but all these people say that my chemical sensitivity will go away when I have these fillings removed. I'm saying, don't listen to them. That's a very few people that are telling you that. But the major people don't have that kind of reaction. And he said to me last night, he said, you said anybody that wants to have those amounts, you tell them to call me because he's suffering terribly because he had it done. Only, you know, a few months on the, eight months on the diet he had it done. Suffering terribly. Okay, next question. Back there. Uh, what kind of water do you recommend? Oh, thank you for mentioning that. I forgot to talk about water. Don't drink water. It's easy. Water is, is a solvent. If you look up in an archaeological archeologi book, the first product on this earth under solvent is water. Water is a distilled substance with lots of bacteria. It comes down and dissolves rock. That's how strong it is. It dissolves rock so that plants can eat. Water is a solvent. It will leach out of your body. Those of you over, under, or near 60 and over, you remember what we did? How much water did we ever drink? Three sips a day at school? Three sips of water a day at school. The rest was milk. <laughs> Unless your folks allowed soda pop instead of milk. Yeah. So it was three sips of water a day. When did water become a big issue? 1962, and they started bottling and selling it. Then they paid a bunch of doctors to say, you need eight glasses a day. Everybody drink eight glasses of milk a day. And that's when it came out. But the Aborigines and the natives know you do not drink water. The more water you drink, the more dry you become. It rips the fats out of your body and starts dissolving them. Now, everybody needs some solvents because of the amount of toxicity in your body. So, maybe half a cup of water a day, cup at the most. You know how much water I've consumed over the last two weeks? A cup. I have about two swallows a day. For other people, they need more. But you don't need much. Because the more water you drink, the more you need. Why? Because it dries you out. It dissolves and leaches from your digestive tract everywhere. It causes fat deficiencies. Most people get dry mouth because the brain is dumping all of its poisons out the mouth. It rips all the fats from the mouth. So your mouth gets dry. You get cotton mouth. 
Is that water deficiency? No, not a water deficiency, it's a fat deficiency. Take a mixture of about six to ten parts uh, coconut cream and one part honey. Mix that together and put that on your lips and a little bit on your tongue. Do that every time your lips get dry. You'll see that you don't need water. Or you take a little honey and butter when you get thirsty. You'll see that you don't need water. It's fat that you need. The more water you drink, the drier your lips are going to be. When I used to drink water before talking like this 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I used to drink water. I was drinking water, I'd have this whole dryness, this caking over there, and I wouldn't just be peeling Lilla, I'd be peeling my lips with blister. Stop drinking water, and I just have the, you know, my kefir, or I take the coconut cream and put it on with the honey in it. It doesn't happen anymore. My mouth is not dry. Stop drinking all that water. Yes, Ray. I thought I'd comment on that too. Um, I was practically vegan about seven, eight years ago. I always had a bottle of water with me. I was always thirsty, never could get enough. Now I don't get it at all. I drink four, four jars of vegetable juice a day. And I train physically two, three hours a day, but keep it night martial arts. Three, four hours a night, sweat like crazy, I'm never thirsty. So that's seven years on this diet. That's pretty good, I'd say, wouldn't you? Yeah. So, the, all the myths are out there are for the people in the manufacturing of water. Forget it. Water's not what you need. And when you're eating whole foods, meat is even 55, 45 to 55% water. Milk is 82% water. Fruits are 86 to 92% water. Where's your water deficiency? Doesn't happen. When you cook foods, however, then there's a problem. Then you lose the fat. Yes? What are your thoughts on donating blood? How it mm -hmm. turns the body? Well, I've donated blood a few times, um, only to people that I knew that, uh, you know, needed, that I, they were close to me. Um, you know, when you give a pint of blood, it takes about anywhere from 90 to 120 days to replace it. If you feel that you're that strong and healthy, do it. If it's somebody close to you and they need it, and you have the same blood type, do it. But otherwise, I wouldn't sacrifice, you know, just to be a good Samaritan, because you need to be healthy. And so I consider that. Yeah. Yes? What about um, making vegetables more digestible by lacto-fermentation? Okay, there's a whole crowd that does that. There are several civilizations, I mean, tribes, people who do that, who don't have access to a lot of food. So, you know what, they don't have as many goats or sheep or anything like that. So they will ferment vegetables so that they'll digest better. However, they still have an alkalinization reaction in the body. Mm -hmm. They don't digest raw meats well, so they'll have to cook them. And then you have the degeneration that still sets in. So it's not a preferable thing to do but it will work. Now, I do ferment some of my vegetable juices for all those times that I was forced to eat those cooked vegetables. Now, that's a detoxification process, but it should be a small part of the diet. You ferment anything that you've eaten cooked to replace all that bacteria and enzymes that were cooked out of that food to help you remove the residues, the byproducts of having utilized those things. So it is a therapeutic thing, but it's not the way to get healthy. And it's not the way to get strong in itself. It will not give proteins and nutrients to your body that will make you strong and stable. It will clean you out, so it will do it indirectly. But you have to be careful with that because it can cause extreme gas and poor digestion of your other foods. So it has to be implemented. And it often causes a lot of loss of vitamin D because the vitamin D is utilized and that's utilized tremendously when you have those, those excessive alcohols and, and uh, fermented acids that get into the body. Mm -hmm. And they'll start puffing out the skin and they'll start turning white because you're absorbing all the vitamin D. And, uh, you know, I mean, that isn't, let's say, an unattractive thing, but I find that it does impede upon certain skin and uh, perspira perspiring functions, people perspire and smell a little stronger and, you know, those are incidental things. You know, and then you'll use more soap and more deodorant or poison and stuff. There are a lot of side effects that come from that kind of eating, if it's too much. Not just used as a remedy. But, hold it in front. Sometimes we do it 
right when it turns, and sometimes we do it like this, and it's delicious. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yay. I, I'm sorry, I don't even know if it's a yeast or a bacteria, so okay. I'm going to have to go look it up. Yeah. don't know all the Yeah. Great. Well, guess what? We just finished our two-hour tape, so great timing. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.